We're now at the uh, corner of the old Cedar Hill Cemetery. And one of the things that folks sometimes overlook is the fact that the enslaved had lives as humans. And so they lived, worked, and they died. And when they died, they were buried in cemeteries such as this. And this cemetery, uh, we don't know how old it is, but we think it started uh, long before Cedar Hill was named because it was named the Prospect Plantation at that time. There are quite a few indentations which indicates that there were grave sites. I've always heard, we're related to the ones that built the church. That was all I heard. And then when I started doing more research and asking my grandfather more questions, he started giving me more answers. So my grandfather's name is Willie. His mother is Charity Reeves. Her mother is also named Charity Reeves. Charity and William Reeves were married. William's, William Reeves' father's name is Solomon. Solomon Reeves' father is actually Joel Lyde Reeves, who was their uh, slave owner. And Ned Reeves, they were all together in the same home. So he is a relative of mine, and um, he was the founder of Reeves Chapel. Brunswick was the only deep water port in North Carolina. Everything begins in the Lower Cape Fear, begins and ends with Brunswick. The history of the Lower Cape Fear has not been told in depth the way it should have. The rice. The rice was basically what made the South rich. Right along the, the Cape Fear coming up from South Carolina, from, from Southport, North Carolina, every five or ten miles, you're going to run into a little small community of, of African Americans. And basically, those were the, the places where the rice plantations were. And a lot of the folks, when they left home or when they grew up, they didn't never move very far from those plantations. So Brunswick Town was the only deep water port in early North Carolina. It would have been the demarcation point for large vessels like transatlantic slave trading vessels because it could handle these larger ships that could come in and out of the port. So many of those would have been coming across the Atlantic through the Caribbean and to North Carolina, and this would have been the major place where they would have stopped. It was established in 1726 as a world-class port, and it's going to be, end up being the major port for North Carolina, definitely the international port. It'll develop far earlier than Wilmington will. And in terms of its importance as, as an international port, most of the slave vessels, the slaving vessels that come directly from Africa, a lot that come directly from the West Indies, are going to come into Brunswick before they go anywhere else. Many of those individuals were from the rice growing regions of West Africa, places like Sierra Leone and Senegambia. And because of that, they had the skills and the culture that would have been considered uh, very close to what we think of as the Gullah culture today. From the mid-1730s to about 1790, I've been able to document 139 vessels that had human cargo on board. Of that, uh, 92 of them we know for a fact docked at Brunswick. A total of about 969 enslaved persons were brought into the Cape Fear. 760 some disembarked at, uh, at Brunswick, but roughly 650 of those we believe actually this would have been the point of disembarkation, the first time they would have stepped on North American continent since leaving Africa. Okay, the Gullah Geechee Corridor runs from Jacksonville, North Carolina down to Jacksonville, Florida, and I want to say about 30 miles inland. And, but it's, it's primarily dealing with where the Gullahs ended up being placed. So the first individuals to really settle what we think of as Brunswick and the Lower Cape Fear 
were an extended family group called the Moore family. Uh, the Moores were related to James Moore, who was the royal governor in South Carolina in the early 18th century. And it consisted of three brothers, uh, Maurice Moore, Roger Moore, and James Moore. And the three of them really kind of moved into the area with all of their extended family, a very large kin group that became known as the family in the region. Um, and settled around what became Brunswick in 1725. Maurice Moore actually planned the town of Brunswick. And when they moved into the region, not only did they bring in its extended kin network of cousins and people who had married into the family, but they also brought many enslaved individuals along with them. They had come from rice growing regions in and around uh, Charleston and the Ashley Cooper Rivers. And because of that, they really sought to recreate a lot of that plantation agriculture here in the Lower Cape Fear. One of the wharves they come in on is right behind me. This would have been William Dry's Wharf, circa 1740 to about 1765. Uh, so during the peak, you would probably see the majority during Brunswick's existence coming in on that wharf. So Brunswick County in the Lower Cape Fear was an ideal location for rice growing because of its environment. The earliest rice growing that occurs here in the area is what we know as upland rice cultivation. Um, essentially, this would have been large swampy areas that would have been flooded by summer rainfall and sometimes water diverted to those areas from ponds such as Orton Pond. That's the reason why it was constructed in the 18th century and they would cultivate rice in these kind of naturally swampy areas. But what really takes this area into a new level in terms of rice growing is after the American Revolution, many of these rice plantations shift towards the Cape Fear River and towards what we call tidal rice cultivation, where these fields would have been right on the edges of the river itself. Uh, you would have had these swampy areas that could be easily flooded according to the tides and a lot of engineering brought in and all sorts of infrastructure to irrigate the fields based on a system of dikes and canals and all sorts of floodgates to control the amount of water that would come in and off of the fields because rice had to be germinated and grow for much of its growing season in water. Um, so with harnessing that tidal power, uh, it cuts down on the amount of labor that is involved in uh, rice cultivation, and it also just works a whole lot better. This is a rice trunk. This is really what changes and allows the change from the upland marsh to the, t the tidal uh, rice fields. Rice fields are gonna be divided about, there'll be about 20 acres each, and then they'll be subdivided into a half acre to an acre plots but the whole thing is going to be irrigated from the from the tidal flow of the rivers and the creeks so really because of that you're not going to have much um, rice production any further than 20 miles up river the rice trunk these fields are going to be divided they'll have berms um, between them and inside some of those you're going to have these trunks and it's hollow so if I raise this up, you can look in and it's just hollow. So when you're working the tide, say this side is the river, when the tide comes up, somebody will come up and they'll actually, we'll do this side, do this side. They'll pull a pin, raise the trunk up, which will open it to the, and then pull, the, Put the pin back in that'll allow the water to flow in here and then the natural flow will open this gate and the water just flows in and floods the field and when you want to lower the level you reverse the process pull the pin put it in here raise this and then this one flows outward you can also further control just by the 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 level of how how high you raise the gate so it really does revolutionize rice cultivation in the Cape Fear. It's already being done in, in, in South Carolina. But, and that's why when you look at, say, Google Earth, and you follow the Cape Fear River and its branches and a lot of the tributaries, you'll see, you'll still see the remnants of the rice fields. You'll still see all those fields and the dikes and the berms that are inside them.
Well, with the shift to tidal rice culture, one of the primary problems that planters have to deal with, at least for their own safety, is the issue of disease. A lot of these tropical diseases that love low-lying areas of stagnant water are going to thrive in a rice plantation. So things like malaria, yellow fever, all of those are things that planters are going to have to deal with and their enslaved populations are going to have to deal with from the colonial period onward. Usually what happens is malaria and yellow fever we know today as being um, transmitted via mosquitoes. But at that point in time, that whole concept was completely unknown until the late 19th century. Um, so mosquitoes were a vector and the carrier of that disease. But for the most part, planters um, at the time would have thought of this disease as having come from what they called miasmas, or bad air, essentially. And they believed that these uh, fields of rice crops and these stagnant pools of water just kind of bred this bad air that would then allow for these diseases to flourish and affect their families. Essentially, these planters would have to deal with the fact that their mortality rates were incredibly high um, from the colonial period into the antibiotic bellum era. Um, many times malaria was much more deadly for white families than it was for enslaved black families, um, and that's largely due to uh, their lack of exposure to these kinds of tropical diseases that were endemic to places like West Africa. Work on rice plantations for the enslaved was very seasonal. One thing we have to remember about rice plantations is that they operated under a different labor system than what we see on, for example, a tobacco plantation or a cotton plantation. Those types of plantations use what we call gang slavery or gang labor systems, whereas on rice plantations we are viewing a task labor system. So enslaved persons would be basically divided up based on the amount of work that they could do in a day, and they would be classified as either a full hand, a three quarters, half, or even a quarter hand based on their output. And then they would be grouped together for best productivity. The fact that my ancestors, their labor, they are the ones who brought wealth to this area and brought everything to this area. Gullah Geechee, to me, brought me from where we were up to where I am today. Any information that I got on rice and rice cultivation through my family members um, has been um, instigated by myself. I would ask questions and, and, and try to get answers based on information that I found out about rice and rice growing in this area. I would really like for there to be recognition of the Gullah Geechee ancestors um, because we traveled from the rice coast of West Africa and came here, so I would really love the emphasis to be on the fact that we are descendants of these people and just to remember remember the culture, recognize the culture, celebrate that, celebrate the language, continue to pass it down, continue to pass on the foodways, the arts and crafts, the music, all of that. That's how you keep a culture alive and thriving. Pre-American Revolution, most of the Africans were out on those very islands, right, planting and, and cultivating that rice. And a lot of times they were out by themselves. They were isolated. And so they had to develop their own language, their own culture, their own way of doing and saying things, right? So they didn't develop as much of the language, um, much of, as much of the food ways, as much of the, as those folks out on the barrier islands. That's why you would find that, especially down in Beaufort, South Carolina and eastern parts of Georgia, um, you will find that there is a distinct language and a distinct culture that's represented among those folks because they were isolated and had to develop their own ways of talking, relating, and whatever else. Do you know that there were folks over there that spent 35 and 40 years and never even came to the mainland? They didn't know anything but what they were being taught there, you know? Not so much here, you know? Well, we, we, we got it early, so we lost it early, too. It was not a very good thing to descend from the slavery and what it entailed in those days, but I am very pleased with, even though we came from slavery, we were able to right ourselves and make a very successful go of it. As a descendant of rice cultivators, 
I feel a sense of pride and I feel a sense of connection to our mother continent. That's one of the things that we brought over here. That wasn't here before we got here. And we, even though we were stripped from so much of our selves, we still held on to so much of our culture and, and have been able to pass it on and pass it on. And it's, in, it's gone on for generations and that's something to be really proud of, the resilience of our people. I am the second mayor of a small African-American town that was formulated in 1977, right? And our entire existence is based on our evolution from those Gullah Geechee slaves, okay? Now, not all of our evolution was because we're done directly as a result, but the fertilizer plants, the name that we have, right? I can even like chase back and, and take a look at the, the guys, the first African Americans that bought land here. You know, the, the whole nine yards. That that's that's my very very much my source of pride. For our, I would love to you know the elders and the younger people to get together and connect. If you if you have elders that still know something about the Gullah Geechee culture, ask them questions, young people. I learned so much. Um, about our culture by sitting at my grandfather's feet and literally asking him questions. So just more connections with your elders, get together with your family, talk to your granny, ask her about the food that she used to make, where did that come from? Ask her why she pronounces words certain ways and, and you know, different things like that. And then they'll open up and talk to you about, you know, how they grew up. And that's how you help preserve that culture and language. I would like to see um, the rice history um, shared in our educational system, our schools, and I would like to see more um, festivals held to depict what's going on and how the rice festival came about. Our history and our culture is American history and American culture. On the outside, it looks like maybe this culture is dying because a lot of people are not as aware, but a culture only dies when you stop talking about it. And as long as there are black people here in the lower Cape Fear region and all the way down to Florida, it's gonna be some people celebrating and loving Gullah Geechee culture. So we out here, we ain't going nowhere. My favorite, favorite rice dish is definitely neck bones and rice because I would go down to my granny and pop-pop's house and there was always something on the stove. Um, as I get older, I love making different rice dishes for my kids. So I make red rice for my kids, I make chicken bog for my kids, and I just love that they love what I grew up eating. Neck bones, neck bones and rice. I love, I love neck bones and rice, I tell you. Um, I don't even know, I don't even know how I got, I mean, it's like, it's, it's been a part of my life it's just, ever since I can remember. And ever since I was very young, it's been always been a favorite of mine. Uh, it was, or I say used to be, um, to the point where you had to suck on those neck bones to get some meat. Not anymore. I think some, they, they, they're fat and healthy now and they're, they're, they're really good. So yeah, neck bones, rice with some potatoes mixed in. Everything, my wife can fix it for me every Sunday. She knows I'm going to be all right. <laughs> Shrimp fried rice. <laughs> I, I love rice. In fact, I have 10 pounds at the house right now. I eat rice two or three times a week. And all rice dishes are my favorite. So I can say it like that.